May I proceed, Mr. Speaker, sir? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, sir. And thank you so much, distinguished senators. For the record, my name is uh, Ongoya. I'll be making the governor's closing submissions. Distinguished senators, Katasi demands that I open this process by thanking this house for the opportunity given to us as council and the opportunity given to the governor to be heard as we have been heard. The challenges associated with the time notwithstanding, we are satisfied that we have had a fair day in this honorable house. Distinguished senators, the governor invites this house to be guided by certain enduring principles that she will draw the attention of this house to. The governor invi invites this house to be guided by the guidance that was supplied by the famous philosopher Socrates to all persons sitting in the position of judges, which you now do. Four things belong to a judge. To listen courteously, to answer wisely, to consider soberly, and to decide impartially. There is a biblical injunction that also addresses itself to the attributes of judges. I think there is advice that was given by a man called Jethro to a man called Moses in the book of Exodus when Jethro thought that Moses was spending significant amounts of time deciding cases. He advised him to appoint judges to help him decide disputes between the children of Israel. He gave the following attributes, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. The governor holds this senate in the highest possible regard and attributes these attributes that have survived the age of time to this senate. Allow me to deal with what I consider to be some side issues that have arisen in the course of this trial and in the course of the Assembly's final submissions. Distinguished Senators, an issue emerged as to whether member, ISPAC member number 10955, Kirimi Ibrahim Mutwiri, is an active member of ISPAC in good standing. Fortunately for us, like many other professional bodies, the data of many of us professionals is now available in the public databases of the respective professional association. Any senator who cares to search member number 10955 on the member search engine of icepack.com will get a chance to satisfy themselves as to the active status and good standing status of that member. I repeat, member number 10955, each senator is at liberty to search on the website icepack.com slash search hyphen member to establish for themselves the standing of that member. I say that with great humility because it's important that we address ourselves to the substantive issues that have kept us here and that keep us here up to now. It is not for lack of other business, the governor believes, that distinguished senators are sitting in this house after 9 p.m. to resolve this dispute. The governor believes that the issue before this senate is so significant that it should never turn on a matter of side issues. And one senator's such member number 10955 in the icepack.com search engine and establish the active and good standing status of that senator, sorry, of that accountant, my apologies, they will then form their own opinion as to who is standing on the platform of truth and who is standing on the platform of lack of truth in the conduct 
of these proceedings. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'll beseech the timekeepers to remind me at intervals of perhaps 15 minutes because I like managing my time as I get along. It's just my humble plea. Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished senators, impeachment processes, as I have said before, are processes governed by law and legal principles. It is now settled by no lesser authority than the Supreme Court of the Republic of Kenya that public participation is an important pillar of the impeachment process. It therefore means that if an impeachment process is undertaken on a foundation of lack of proper public participation, then that particular impeachment process cannot stand the test of scrutiny. I want to take these senators through the public participation report in volume number five of the county assembly's documents so that these senators in themselves can ascertain whether that principle was satisfied. If the senators can access volume number five, the largest possible volume of the county assembly's documents, I'll beseech them to look at page number 35 of that document. Page number 35 of volume 5. It is the biggest volume in the county assembly document. And if you look at page number 35, there is a photograph on that page which is supposed to be a photograph of the members of the public attending a public participation function at a Bogeta West Ward. I then, distinguished senators who have seen that photo, beseech them to look at page number 30 of the same volume. Page number 30 of that volume which is supposed to be now the public participation event at Abogeta East Ward. On the face of it, the same people in the same seating arrangement taking the same posture at page number 30 at Abogeta East Ward are the same people in the same sitting arrangement taking the same posture that you'll discover at page number 35. I leave it to your judgment about what that says of the integrity of this public participation process. But that's not enough. I'll beseech distinguished senators to turn to page number 331 of that same document. 331 of that same document. May I urge that we start at page 330 for proper context. At page 330 is a title of minutes showing that this should be a public participation event at Akirangondu Ward, sorry, in Akirangondu Ward at Machungulu Social Hall. I'll beseech distinguished centers look at minute number three, which runs from page number 331. And I want you to look at the entire of that minute from where it starts all the way over leaf to page 332. To make my point, I would ask the senators while keeping their finger on that minute to turn to page number 373 of the same bundle while keeping a finger on this page 331, to turn to page 373 of that bundle. 
they will see that these are supposed to be minutes of a public participation function in Mbe Ward at a place called Kimiri MCK. These are supposed to be events done on the same day at the same time. You realize that minute number three of those minutes starts at page 374 and turns over leaf to page number 375. This minute takers somehow meticulously used the same words word for word across one and a half pages of minute taking of an objectively taken set of minutes. Distinguished senators, while at it, I wanted to turn to page 390 of that same bundle. When you turn to page number 390, you'll come across a public participation event that apparently took place in Igembe East Ward at a place called Karaune MCK. And just for comparison, I will then urge you to turn to page number 393. 393, which is supposed to be a public participation event in Adiru Rojine Ward. I try to understand how to pronounce this name in Meru language without of difficulty. Adiru Rojine Ward at a place called Akune MCK. Putting your finger on those two minutes, I want you to look at minute number three of each of those two minutes. The one at page 390 starts from page 390 through page 391 all the way to page 392. And the one starting at page 393, minute 3 starts at page 393 through page 394 all the way to page 395. And you'll discover those minutes use the same words in the same order the same sentences in the same order, word for word, across three pages of minutes. I leave it to your judgments, applying this Socratic standard that I have just prescribed for this sentence. Courteously, you answer wisely, you consider soberly, and you decide impartially, distinguished senators, would you say that this is a public participation process that passed the requisite test of integrity? I just want to demonstrate one thing which can be done without taking too much time, which is page 332 of that document. At page 332 of that document, which is part of the minutes of a public participation event taking place at Akirang in, in Akirangondu Ward at Machungulu Social Hall, at minute number four, at minute number four, you'll come, sorry my apologies, I, I want us to go to page my apologies, I misled you when I referred to 3.32. I want to refer to 3.70. Let me just, let me, let me see whether this brings out the point, then I can conclude just that we don't have a lot of time. Let me look at 3.73. If it doesn't, I'll just go to the next minute, then we clear that in a short while. Yes. Thank you so much. That is the one. I want to look at page 332, minute number four at Akirangondu Ward. The minute taker says as follows, members of the public upon equal and fair representation from across the locations in the ward ended the meeting at 1 p.m. Full stop. A member of staff from the county assembly gave closing remarks and thanked the members of the public 
for exercising their constitutional mandate and conducting their exercise peacefully and inclusively. When you go to page number 375, which are minutes of a completely different word, you also see minute number four in Mbeu word, where members of the public upon fair, upon equal and fair representation from across the locations in the ward ended the meeting at 1 p.m. A member of staff from the county assembly gave the closing remarks and thanked members of the public for exercising their personal mandate and conducting the exercise peacefully and inclusively. The same minute, the same words in the same order. I spoke here about some things being too fantastic to be true. Distinguished senators, these are the sort of things I was referring to. Normal human fallibilities militates against this kind of coincidences. I'll briefly make that point by looking at page 392. At page 392, of the minutes from Igembe eastward. Page 392, after Roman 11 up there, there is an entry, a lady who spoke and was not in support of the impeachment motion said that since the governor was a woman, the MCS were planning to impeach out and needs to give her time to work and complete her term. It follows. Another one said that she doesn't support the impeachment motion because the governor is the only senior most politician from Meru County. I want us to turn to page 395, huh? which is part of the minutes from Adero Rujine Ward. Just after Roman number 11, a lady who spoke and was not in support of the impeachment motion said that since the governor was a woman, the MCS were planning to impeach her out and needs to give her time to work and complete her term. It follows, another one said that she doesn't support the impeachment motion because residents of Meru County are tired with these unending fights between the governor and the MCS. Distinguished senators, I leave it to your able judgment as able men, such as fear God, of truth, hating covetousness, using this standard of Jethro, as he advises Moses, to determine for yourself the quality of public participation that underwrites this motion. We are looking at a document that is 1,344 pages. Time cannot allow us to continue with this kind of analysis, but the point has been made. Allow me to move to the next point. I want to deal with the various allegations that have been made against the governor in this impeachment motion. If you look at the impeachment motion at count number one, the governor is accused of gross violation of the constitution and other laws, and a general allegation of violations of laws is made there. The burden for us is to establish whether the ground in support of that allegation has been made. I will start by dealing with ground four for good order. I will deal with the other grounds as I carry on with these submissions. The governor is accused of dismissing Dr. Ntoiti, Paul Mwaki, Kenneth Kimathi, Mbae, and Joseph Kithure in usurpation of the powers of appointing authorities. The move of the motion was taken through this ground as against what was count for, 
paragraph 16 of the motion that was before this house in September, in, no, in November last year, my apologies, in November last year. She confirmed that there has been no new action on the part of the county government in respect of these officials. She confirmed that what she was complaining about here is the same action that informed the previous allegation in the previous impeachment motion. While at it, and so that I don't revisit this question, I'll also deal with count number three, paragraph three of the present motion, where the governor is accused of employing a bloated workforce of at least 111 personal staff in her office. The move of this motion came here and she conceded that this was the same allegation in, in count number four, paragraph G, of the motion that this Senate dealt with in November last year. The question I want this Senate to grapple with is this, and this is a question of principle. Is it permissible for this Senate to be called upon to re-debate the same fact over which it debated and acquitted the governor? Is it permissible in law? Is it permissible in good sense to re-debate and make a decision on it. Are these grounds you are going to vote for, or are these grounds in your private discussion and deliberation are going to move that must be struck out first before you consider the residue of the motion? That's something that I invite this Senate to grapple with so that it guides future processes of this nature. I make not an argument that we, the governor invites this Senate to take a position on allegations that have been debated here in previous impeachment motions and in respect of which the governor has been cleared of the same. May I draw the attention of this Senate to the fact that the move of this motion confirmed that in respect of the claim of employment of a bloated workforce, the same list of employees in the same order that was presented here in November last year is the same list of employees in the same order that she has presented here today and sought that this Senate reviews its previous decision and enters a different decision from the one it entered last year. The second set of matters that I want to deal with is matters that are pending active litigation in court as we stand here today. What I'll describe as matters that are sub -judice. Count number one, paragraph one of the impeachment motion alleges that the governor illegally revoked the appointment of CPA Virginia Kawira Miriti as CEO of the Meru County Public Service Board. Distinguished Senators, it is not in dispute that this matter is pending active litigation as Meru Employment and Labor Relations Court, case number E002 of 2024, Virginia Kawira Miriti versus the Governor Meru County. The governor invites this court to consider as a matter of principle what is its policy on matters sub judice? What is the policy of this Senate on matters that are pending active litigation before other competent institutions of dispute resolution? Evidence of the pendency of that case has, of course, been supplied in volume number two of the governor's documents at page number 
14. Another matter that the governor wants you to apply the same mind on, that is matters that are actively pending in court, is what I referred to earlier as count number one, paragraph four, on the alleged illegal dismissal of Dr. Ntoiti, Paul Mwaki, Kenneth Mbai, Joseph Kithure Mberia. In addition to the fact that this is a matter that this Senate has already applied its own mind upon and made a decision on, it is not in dispute that this matter has been and continues to be in active litigation in our court. This matter went into court as Meru Employment and Labor Relations Petition Number 1 of 2022 and is now pending an appeal. Evidence of the pendency of that appeal process is at volume number seven, at page number 71, volume 1B of the governor's documents. Again, distinguished centers, with tremendous humility, I invite this house to take this as a question of principle. What is the policy the legal policy of this Senate on matters that are actively pending in our courts, such as ground number one, sorry, paragraph four, count number one of this impeachment motion. If you look at ground number two, paragraph six, and ground number three, Paragraph 11 of the impeachment motion. That motion, just for good order, is in the County Assembly's Documents, Volume 1. This is the matter relating to the alleged, or the, the case of murder of one Daniel Muthiani, a liar's sniper, and contributions towards his family, and the role, connection, or status of Kiambe Crispius Manyara, an accused person in that murder. The County Assembly, at volume number two of its documents, at page 429, has supplied this house with the charge sheet for that murder case. Distinguished Senators, I beseech you to again make a principled decision. In a matter such as this where the county assembly by its own documents admits that it's a matter pending active trial in our murder court, our high court, what is the policy of this Senate towards matters such as those? I submit that this is a matter of principle because this should be able to guide future impeachments so that we don't have to revisit these questions of principle, people can be guided by the decision of this Senate once and for all. Finally, the impeachment process itself in its entirety, I wish to refer you to volume number two of the governor's document at pages 28 to 32. Page 28, you can see Meru Constitutional Petition Number E013 of 2024. The parties to that case are Honorable Kawira Mwangaza, petitioner, and the County Assembly of Meru, respondent. The two parties now appearing before you and represented by counsel, as has been the case. If we turn to page number 31 of the governor's volume number two, there is a ruling of court which says the upshot of the above is that the impeachment process is halted pending my ruling. And this, since this matter is of public interest, the ruling 
on the interested parties and the main petition will be delivered on 29th July 2024 via email to all parties. It is in the public domain that that ruling was not delivered on that day and is still pending delivery and this order remains in force. As a matter of principle, I invite centers to reflect on this question. Because the governor has been brought here by the county assembly claiming that it wants to strike a blow for the rule of law. And yet we are here debating this matter in the face of an order reading, and I quote, the upshot of the above is that the impeachment process is halted. As a matter of principle, distinguished senators, what position do you want to take on this matter? You are the judges. You will make the decision one way or the other. I have done my part as legal representative to my clients. I have made full and candid disclosure that we may be perpetuating a violation of the rule of law. We may be. I am not the decision maker. I leave the eventual decision to your able hands, distinguished senators. Is this the way we shall grow our institutions if a court of competent jurisdiction can make an order such as this? The county assembly proceeds in violation of this order the governor has told you on her part she has taken some action on this violation and at page 35 onwards you will see a contempt of court application that she has filed. She has done her part. The court will deal with that. Shall we sitting here in good conscience and our attention having been drawn to these facts perpetuate this process which on the face of it the county government has undertaken in violation of a valid court order. It is not for the governor, it is not for her council to make that decision. Distinguished senators, the heavier task lies with you to make a decision one way or the other on these questions of principle touching on those specific paragraphs of those specific counts that I have alluded to and on this impeachment process as a whole as I have drawn your attention to page 30 of volume number 2 of the governor's documents. Let me proceed by addressing you briefly on the Public Audit Act. Distinguished Senators, I beseech you as you make this decision this evening to be guided by the provisions of Section 53 and Section 54 of the Public Audit Act. I say this in summary in response to the multiple audit questions that have arisen in the course of this hearing. Time will not permit me to point at specific audit queries, having in present here, we know those audit questions. Section 53 of the Public Audit Act has a side note entitled Implementation of Reports. These are audit reports by an accounting officer. Implementation of reports by an accounting officer. Subsection 1 of Section 53 of the Public Audit Act provides, and I quote, the relevant accounting officer of a state organ or public entity shall within three months after Parliament has considered and made recommendations on the audit report. So first, there is an audit report. Two, there is parliamentary consideration of the audit report, then three, there are actions to be taken, which are take the relevant steps to 
to implement the recommendations of parliament on the report of the auditor general or give explanations in writing to parliament on why the report has not been acted upon the law itself actually anticipates failure to act on those reports with reason honorable senators there is a principle in law called the subsidiarity principle the subsidiarity principle in law dictates that a dispute must be resolved at the lowest institution competent to resolve it so for example as a litigation lawyer if i have a case that can competently be handled by the high court but now i look at the law it can also competently be handled by a lower court a magistrate's court i am obligated to file that case in the magistrate's court which is the lowest court competent to hear that dispute we now know that the county assembly of meru has not exercised its mandate by seizing this report and making necessary recommendations or steps to be taken to implement the report instead it has picked the reports and come to this house with those reports i want to believe speaking for myself that that is overburdening this very busy house i want to suggest to you senators that if you set a precedent here in this proceedings that a county assembly can do that it means that if we get a year where there are 47 county governments with some issues and you know better than i do that virtually every year every county government has some issues in the audit report it is possible for county assemblies to bring here 47 impeachment motions i suspect that that may break the functional machinery of this house i think that you better take a position in this matter that reminds county assemblies that they also have a role to discharge to sit invite relevant officers of the executive interrogate audit reports resolve disputes that can resolve there first then come here with only such residues of issues that the relevant officers have proved to be incorrigible that is my humble submission distinguished senators there is a cadre of claims before you where i submit respectfully that the county assembly is in fact the author of the problem then it has brought the governor here the alleged failure to appoint the chairpersons of the meru county revenue board <coughs> meru microfinance corporation meru youth service board and meru county investment and development board i invite you to look at the correspondences at pages 53 54 57 58 60 61 62 65 67 84 and the document at pages 85 all the way to 163 and the document at page 135 of volume 1b of the governor's documents i will not read them but save just to summarize that these are the multiple correspondence between the office of governor and the office of the clerk of the county assembly there is no doubt distinguished senators that the governor nominated persons to these offices if the governor did not furnish sufficient particulars the county assembly had the option of rejecting those names just consider them and reject them so that there is no jam in the system so to speak what has happened here is that for more than one year the county assembly has engaged the governor's office in correspondence but failed to make a decision on the chairpersons of these boards and yet there is nothing the governor can do without 
the county assembly first making a decision one way or the other. The law, for example, distinguished senators, requires that ambassadors in this country, cabinet secretaries, be appointed by the president, but upon approval by the National Assembly. If the president were to forward names of cabinet secretaries to the National Assembly, then the National Assembly takes one year engaging the president in correspondence on those names without making a decision on them. Then eventually moves a motion to impeach the president for failure to appoint. That is malice in the extreme. I have reflected on the various categories of malice. I submit respectfully. This will fall into the category of malice of the highest order. This is a teaching aid in malice. It is inconceivable that there can be a higher grade of malice than this. You have been told that the governor has failed to implement the recommendations stroke resolutions of the county assembly. You are taken through the letter by the clerk claiming to be forwarding a resolution of the county assembly. In fact, that letter, when you look at it, it says that the Hansard is also enclosed. We have asked for that Hansard. We have asked for that resolution. Distinguished senators, it has not been presented to you. The question is, how will you impeach the governor on the strength of such an allegation? But more importantly for me, more importantly for me, questions were put here to a number of witnesses to show who that report of the assembly of the of the committee of the assembly is addressed to. That report was addressed to the petitioners, not the governor. Who was that report copied to? That report was copied to the various officers who allegedly the petitioners had sought to be removed from office, one by one. That report was neither addressed to nor copied to the governor. But now you are told to make a finding that the governor failed to implement that report that was neither addressed to her nor copied to her. As a matter of fact, can we say that in accordance with the law, the County Assembly of Meru has established this fact. I repeat, it is not in my place to make that determination. It is in your place, distinguished senators, to make that determination. I invite you to make that determination with this factual matrix in your mind so that you vote that in good conscience, a governor who is neither the addressee of a letter nor copied in the letter can be removed from office on an allegation of failure to implement the contents of that letter. Factual matters on the dismissal of Dr. Ntoiti, Paul Mwaki, Kenneth Kimathimbae, and Joseph Kathurenberia have arisen in addition to the principal matters of pendency of court cases in them. Factual matters have arisen. To the factual question whether these people have been dismissed from office, the county executive says in charge of public service has been here and has adduced evidence that these people, some of them, their contracts ran out by a fluxion of time that a contract that has ended, has ended. Number two, you are told the governor never dismissed these people. Good people, distinguished senators, would it have been easier than for the county assembly to present us with at least a sample dismissal letter of any of these people? The multiple volumes before you contain very many documents except anything in the name of a dismissal letter, even to prove that fact of an allegation of dismissal. You are going to make a decision this evening 
I want you in good conscience to reflect on whether you can dismiss a governor for alleged dismissal of an employee without the dismissal letter before you, without an affidavit of that employee before you claiming to have been dismissed, and yet you are told, remove this governor from office. Correct. An allegation has been made that this governor deliberately and knowingly misled the public that 86 million shillings had been raised through pay bill number 247247, account number 0400163917899. First, let me contextualize that video. We had the opportunity to review that video, distinguished senators, and you are aware that other videos have been played to show just the amount of mud that was thrown at the senator, so at the governor, not by the family of the deceased, not by the wife of the deceased, but by persons, whether called activists or other leaders from Meru County. You listen to that clip and you have no doubt in your mind the governor is addressing those leaders who are throwing mud at her. I think that when I finally document the story of this governor, as I hope one day I'll get to do, she's the only leader who has been expected to have mud thrown at her with no corresponding right to respond. Because every time she responds, those very scurrilous attacks, she is brought here for impeachment. All of us had somebody claiming that a body of a deceased person would be placed in the home of the governor and to remain there. And if push comes, we will be brought to this Senate. How do we expect a fellow citizen not to respond? Human beings have an instinct of anger, have an instinct of shame, have an instinct of pride that is natural, normal human instinct. There's nothing inherently wrong in those human values. It's just the way God made us as human beings. And when the governor responds to those leaders, clearly saying those leaders must then support the deceased wife, build a house for her, buy her a car, start a foundation to support her children. I think Judged in context, that is a governor who is empathetic to this widow and who is calling for her to be assisted rather than being taken advantage of for political ends or possibly for business ends. I would want this particular charge to be understood in that context, distinguished senators. Ground number three at Paragraph 8, an allegation is made of an alleged use of manual payroll. First, I think sufficient evidence has been laid here that this was an issue in the audit report. The county assembly is yet to consider that audit report and recommend appropriate action or seek answers from the county executive. Evidence has been led to you that this governor inherited a government where manual payrolls were a systemic problem. In fact, she has finished that problem before this impeachment motion was filed. That is something I beseech you to keep at the back of your mind as you make a decision one way or the other on these proceedings. Evidence has been laid before you that the issue of manual register has appeared in audit reports in respect of an excess of more than 40 counties. What lesson do we learn from that? This may be a systemic government problem beyond Meru County. And therefore the proper interventions by legislative and oversight institutions such as this is to provide systemic solutions. What can we do to ensure that IPPD numbers of staff are processed much faster to conduce an environment where uh, payrolls are run without the necessity to resort to manual payrolls as we wait for IPPD numbers. You will empathize with the governor that
that if her government were to keep kindergarten teachers without salary for eight months pending processing of IPPD numbers by another government institution, that may as well be an unfair labor practice which will also violate the Constitution. I have addressed the question of employing a bloated workforce. As a matter of fact, the governor has not employed a bloated workforce. As a matter of fact, this matter has been dealt before in a previous impeachment motion. As a matter of fact, evidence has been laid here of the governor's office rejecting other staff being sent to her office. I beseech you to keep that fact at the back of your mind as you make this decision. Finally, on the allegation of paying Kiambi Crispus Manyara, a public communications officer in the office of governor full salary while in remand, distinguished senators, I want you in good conscience to make a decision whether governors pay staff. Just in the government organogram, whether a governor pays staff. The appointment letter of this particular staff shows that these actually are staff of the county public service board. That's the appointing authority, that's the disciplining authority. So that where a staff who is charged in court is supposed to be either suspended or interdicted and relevant communication made to the payroll team, that would be the function of the county public service board, which is an independent board established as such under the County Government Act. To blame the governor for the failure or omission of an independent board, which if the governor sought to interfere with, that may as well be a ground of impeaching her, that will be putting this governor in a grave dilemma. We beseech you not to put this governor or any other governor in such a position of dilemma. The Supreme Court of Kenya, in the case of Sonko versus the County Assembly of Nairobi, set a principle, and I quote, though a political process, impeachment is sanctioned by the Constitution and the law, and it is not a platform to settle political scores. It is well within the rights of the governor to adduce evidence before you to show what political machinations are there so that you can contextualize her allegations that these are uh, processes to settle political scores. Make no mistake, distinguished senators, the governor has set out here. She is a leader like any other leader. She is subject to oversight like any other leader. She is subject to sanction like any other leader, but let it be fair oversight, let it be fair sanction, let it not be politically motivated sanction. A side issue has been raised here that this governor is waving agenda card. When the governor was brought here in September last year, she told you this house that she was a victim of misogyny. She didn't stop here. She played video clips here for you to see with your own senses, for you to hear with your own senses, for you to feel with your own senses. The decision was yours, and the hands out of this house shows that even this senator was abhorred by the misogyny that was displayed in those videos. The governor is not creating a narrative of misogyny. The governor presented evidence of misogyny before this house. A narrative has been created here that this governor has been given two opportunities before. An impression being created that this governor was perhaps convicted and pardoned. Truth is, this governor has been acquitted on every other occasion that she has been brought here. And therefore, you can't blame her for whatever decision this Senate made based on the evidence that has been brought before the Senate. The case of Martin Nyaga Wambora before the Court of Appeal of Kenya set out the principle that allegations for removal of a governor must be serious, substantial, and weighty. Let's face it. If we want to 
look for technical infractions of law, that is easy. We can get a technical infraction of law on any officer in any office, on any citizen, whatever situate. The principle as enunciated by our court is that to remove a governor from office, the allegation must be serious, substantial, and weighty. And it's in this context that I understood the clarification sought. Five minutes, thank you. The clarification as sought by Honorable uh, Senator Kajuang as to whether labor disputes, employment disputes, would form a basis of an impeachment motion. This institution of parliament has employees. I leave it to your own assessment as whether there are any employees that have ever taken this institution to court. What is sure is that there's an entire court called the Employment and Labor Relations Court whose business is to resolve labor disputes every day. We don't create institutions for fun. That institution was created because there was an understanding that in our day-to-day -day lives, people are going to have labor disputes. And therefore, to use a labor dispute that is properly before a court of competent jurisdiction to remove a governor from office, that in and of itself does not pass the test of seriousness, substantiality, and weight. The Court of Appeal also established as a principle that a nexus must be drawn between the governor and the alleged gross violations of the Constitution or any law. So that where the County Public Service Board, for example, fails to interdict or suspend an employee who is charged in a court of law, it strains my imagination how anyone even the most fertile imagination on earth can create a nexus between that and the governor. I leave it to the distinguished house here to make a decision on that question. In conclusion, distinguished senators, I have been reflecting on the life and the times of Honorable Kawira Mongaza. In my other world, Mr. Speaker, I am a teacher and I talk to my law students every day in a mentorship program, and I was telling them that in the fullness of time, when I am tasked to make my intellectual contributions on gender and the law, my writing will not be on the two-thirds gender principle. My writing will be on the struggle to sustain a woman governor in Meru County. It is difficult for me to imagine of any public official in this country who has been subjected to the trials and tribulations of this governor. This governor who stands here, I look at her and see either my elder sister or my mother. I can't imagine of a lesson in resilience than that that is embodied in this woman who sits here before you as governor. I beseech you to have the weight of this submission in your conscience as you grapple with the principal issues, the evidentiary issues, and the factual issues that I have raised this evening. I beseech you to acquit this governor on each of the three counts. I rest the governor's final submissions. Thank you, counsel. Now, honorable senators, ladies and gentlemen, we will now pursue on to rules 27 of the rules of procedure as contained in the third schedule of our standing orders. We will proceed to a camera session. And therefore, at this juncture, I'll ask the parties to withdraw from the chamber, the members of the public to withdraw from the chamber, and the media to cease live broadcast forthwith. <laughs>